Hi, and welcome to episode of Center Nation. My name is Brandon Sparks. And I'm Thomas Horton. And we're trying something new again <laughs> after COVID-19. But this is a good thing. This is a good thing. Uh, our our podcast deals with genre, and specifically, usually, sh- sub-genres. And we wanted to find a way to go more in depth with the topics we discuss. What I found out during April when Thomas and I were doing sports movies is that Thomas and I can talk about one movie for an hour and a half pretty easily. And so I want to change things up a little bit. And essentially we're going to spend a month on one genre and we're going to talk about the, the genre as an overview in one episode. We're going to do two episodes about specific movies. And then we're going to do a director about that genre at the end of the month for this month's genre. We're doing Texas movies and kind of like um, our faith based films. I feel like Texas movies are not really a defined genre. Would you agree with that, Thomas? Yeah, I mean, it's it's something you can obviously point to like, oh, that movie is like set in Texas. But yeah, we want to explore like, what does that mean? And if, if you're just set in Texas, does that make you a Texas movie? Like, what does it mean to be a Texas movie? I don't think anyone knows yet, but hopefully by the end of this episode, we'll know. Yeah. So when you think of a Texas movie, what do you think of? Uh, usually like a like a Western or a neo Western, like, you know, okay. any anywhere from, uh, you know, a John Ford film or something like Red River uh, all mm-hmm. the way up to like, obviously, Bonnie and Clyde is something that I think you, you immediately go to as kind of a neo Western um, and uh, all the way up to like Hell or High Water, just kind of this idea of like lawlessness of like a like a frontier still even even in modern day like no country for old men uh usually crime related um yeah yeah that's that's kind of one of the big i think tropes of this genre is this kind of i i wrote down law enforcement uh and either law enforcement and people trying to solve crimes or this kind of like outlaw mentality that you're like you said is present in the early westerns the, all the way up to to now where it's still kind of seen as like the old wild wild west basically and that's carried over all these decades and there's also been a few other things and we're going to delve into that because i think there's even like weird there's small subgenres within the genre of texas movies but they're all they all have similarities so thomas mentioned kind of the early westerns like red river rio bravo the searchers kind of these early john wayne movies we're not picking one of those the one we're picking to kind of talk about the early beginnings of a Texas movie is George Stevens giant, this three and a half hour long sprawling multi-generational epic about this old rancher in Texas who owns like a half a million acres of land. And it's kind of showcasing the changing of the times. It stars Rock Hudson, Elizabeth Taylor and James Dean in his final role. And Rock Hudson plays Jordan Beck Benedict Jr., and he Elizabeth Taylor is this young woman in Maryland. Bick goes up to Maryland to buy a horse and he brings uh, Elizabeth Taylor back with him and they get married. On the ranch is kind of this handyman, like guy who works there, who's Jet Rank, who's played by James what, Dean. What a name. I, what a Jet yeah. Rank. I, every time they said it, I was like, yes. <laughs> and he looks like a Jet Rank. Yeah. Like, it's just like, it feels like, again, remember how we talked about League of Their Own where like uh, Madonna feels like the Madonna of the group. Mm. James Dean feels like the James Dean. It's, the, you know, uh, <laughs> I going into this, and I, I think I told you this like as soon as I watched it. Going into this, I had, I had not seen Giant. I'd seen it in pieces, but I'd seen Rebel Without a Cause a few times, yeah. and I'm, I've never really been a big fan of that one. I, I love Liz Taylor. Never really been blown away by that movie, and and because of that, like never really understood the the Dean. Like I I get that he like you know. Mm-hmm. burned out instead of fading away and that usually leads to like a legend growing around a person but i never got the like yeah oomph of of james dean until i saw this movie and this yeah he's he's incredible in this it's easily his best film he's electric like he the the, yeah. the charisma just comes through one i don't know i always find him in rebel i always find him kind of like whiny and and like yeah i don't i don't really like his character so then like he himself his persona doesn't come through as much but uh if it, it feels like dean because he, I think even in East of Eden, he's playing a teen in both those movies. Mm. And he was kind of used as like teen angst. Like that was James Dean. And Giant is the exact opposite. And it's kind of you're seeing essentially the rise and fall of a man with James mm-hmm. Dean. Of like what happens when you're when you're dirt poor and working for someone 
to where you get to a point by the end where you basically own everything and he, he's just cool like and you you see him yeah. you see him lose his cool as he like gains all this money yeah he, you, you can see him yeah. kind of lose himself in it but the I, my favorite scene in this movie i think is when so so bick's sister dies and bick hates jet but bick's sister leaves a patch of their land to jet and um and the, the scene when they inform Jet that he's getting this land is amazing because he's tying a lasso the whole time they're telling him and he's like not really looking at anyone and he's he's just kind of like they're like hey you just inherit you, you you know this guy who like didn't own anything to his name they're like hey you just inherited this land and he's like okay and he like gets up and he's like standing <laughs> in the doorway like like twirling his lasso around he's like I think I might keep it and it's just it's amazing yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there. So there's this. That's a that's a point to bring up with Dane, and I think even with Brando, because that's how I felt when I first watched Brando in a movie, mm -hmm. where I was like, "Dude, him eating a sandwich is the most fascinating thing I've ever seen before in my mm -hmm. life." It's like the way he like just he always kind of has some weird little business going on, where it feels like he's more focused on that weird little thing than he is with what people are saying. Does that does that all go back to Kazan? Maybe. I, it's, but it's it's very much just like method style of like it's something about it is like that thing you're doing is the most fascinating thing I've ever seen an actor mm -hmm. do. But I mean, there, there's so many ways to play that scene. You know, this guy who who has nothing and and it, and he's also he's kind of gone off on this on this rant before about like how it's wrong for them to own that land because they stole it from the natives and all that stuff. So so you you can tell that he's got a lot of mixed feelings about land ownership and even about staying in Texas. Cause he's talked about like just leaving Texas as soon as he can. So, so there's a lot going on when he hears this news that he's a landowner now, but he just, he's plays it so cool. And it is, it's, it's awesome. And that, I think that's to see his character. I mean, that, that is probably the best moment for his character. He is, he is almost like he's pure there and, and you just see him get warped by, by wealth throughout the rest of the movie. Another scene that really kind of hit me was when when he discovers oil and he has the he and it starts blowing up. He's just covered in oil after it explodes and he goes to Bix uh, to to Rietta, goes to their house to say, I found oil. I'm going to be richer than you than you ever wished you could be, basically. Mm -hmm. And it weirdly, I don't know why, but it, that that kind of sequence reminds me of There'll Be Blood. Yeah a lot yeah like when it, he's pour, like when the oil is pouring on him and he is covered he's not recognizable to me it's just it looks like this it's like a manifestation of like what he's turning into one of, one of my other favorite favorite moments in this movie and it and it speaks to i mean this this is this is a very texas thing I, you know it's we, yeah. we've talked about like southern gothics on this on, on the podcast before which is like uh, you, you know, it's where it's the sense of place is so important to the the story. And and, and and a lot of people like Tennessee Williams have written Southern Gothics and it's like it can't be set anywhere else. It would change the people. It would change the story. And this is like a Texas Gothic. Like it, it is it is so Texas down to its core. And, and, and one of those things is like this, these families that are that are otherwise rednecks who are just oil rich. And uh, there's this line where Liz Taylor is talking to these like just hicks. The, they probably grab these. I mean, they don't even seem like actors. They probably grabbed them off of the range somewhere. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we got a little oil well down on our land. It, it does pretty well. It pulls in about a million, a million. It's, it's like a million a month, right? She, 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 she goes a million. Oh, a year. Is, oh no, a million a yeah, month. And she goes, and like, oh, oh. Yeah. well, they go, it pulls in about a million. And she goes, oh, a million a month. And they go, or she goes, oh, a million a year. And they say, no, a million a month. And she said, wow, a million barrels of oil a month. They go, nah a million dollars <laughs> <laughs> and you're looking and it's and it's like I, I don't know what year it is it's one of, so it's coming in it's probably 1920s around that point because i know the thing about this movie i don't think it actually ever states when things are taking place if that makes sense like you're never seeing a title card for oh it's 1919 or it's 1920 you kind of only have like flag like again flagpoles of like so their son-in-law is going to the war so like world war ii plays a, a big factor and and kind of i guess a three and a half hour movie <laughs> i don't know where to say where it was at kind of like like about an hour and 45 two hours in maybe a little bit over half 
Um, so you don't really know like where you're at in time, but you're seeing this changing of the time. And I think you mentioned this. You said how the, the movie felt like it was getting more modern as it went on. And when I watched it, I, I agree with you. They start changing. All of the production design starts changing. Mm. Like the color palette begins to change. And their mansion in, in, in Rietta in the in the 20s and 30s era, it starts to feel like, or 20s era, it feels like it's gone with the wind. It feels like it's Tara. Yeah. And it's like very brown and fire, fire's coming from the, from the fireplace. It's very kind of this earthy, almost like sepia tone. And then by the end of it, it's like 1950s, 19, 1950s like style architecture mm-hmm. of like white couches, white walls. They've repainted the entire mansion to where it like matches with that style. Yeah. Once, once they, once they get into oil themselves, you see the the whole, I mean, that the exterior of the house is still the same, but they get a swimming pool put in and then the whole production yeah. design just changes. The thing about this movie, it's very much in why, why I think it was, it's kind of like, I, I see it as one of the big quintessential like Texas movies because one big trope, and we'll talk about this as we go on, is kind of the idea of like a family drama or like a family conflict in some cases over generations. And this is definitely about that. And it's about, rock hudson it kind of it kind of comes up a little bit at the end and more like maybe kind of on the nose part of it but he's essentially trying to keep hold of his legacy is what it is as like his family it's like he's the he's the only man left of his family he's trying to do what his father did and his grandfather did and as time goes on he's still kind of stuck in those old ways Mm -hmm. and time is just dragging him as he goes and he's expecting his kids to do the same thing that he did and he doesn't really want to go into oil because he thinks it's more about like the land side of it. Maybe he doesn't want rank to come in and desecrate his family land. Cause rank, once he finds oil, wants to basically explore all of it. That little parcel of land wasn't enough. It had to be everything. And, and Bick is just kind of like, doesn't know what to do. Well, I'm well, talking, you know, you brought up like the, the, the quintessential Texas thing or these big family dramas. I mean, that's, uh even outside of film that's dallas was probably one of the biggest soaps ever and that was just oil and texas oil politics and families and and all that as well so that's that's a major part of the the you know texas identity within storytelling and giant was or dallas was heavily inspired by giant because when you're reading it's talking about like both productions focus on the struggle, the conflict between uh, oilmen and cattlemen in Texas. And so Giant came out 1956. And it's it's still kind of a Western at the beginning. Not much, but there's like kind of Western elements of like the landscape, their cattlemen, and that's kind of how they're making money. But it definitely is about kind of this changing of the times and how if you don't change with the time, time will just drag you right along with it is what it feels mm-hmm. like. And... Uh, so it came out in 1956, was nominated for nine Academy Awards. George Stevens, who was directing it for the lead role of of Leslie, it was between Elizabeth Taylor and Grace Kelly. He went with Elizabeth Taylor. He was, he was a little biased anyway. I mean, they'd, they'd worked together before. Yeah, and they worked together a lot uh, throughout their career. I guess Grace Kelly was probably... Was it peak Grace Kelly? I, I think a little that that was a little bit before her like Hitchcock work, right? Uh, actually, it's at the tail end of it. Oh, okay. Fifty six. Fifty six was her last year when she did movies. Oh, okay. So yeah. it's it's coming off of Rear Window and Rear Window, Country Girl, which she won an Oscar for, Dallin for Murder, To Catch a Thief. So this would have been if she did it, it would have been like probably her last movie she did in Hollywood was Giant, which would have been a a crazy one to go out on. I would say. So how would you describe it as Texas? Would it just be, we've talked about family, uh, the Texas landscape. Is there any other things that like make it Texas? I, I mean, I think the idea of, I, I don't know, being tied to like a ranch. And, and I think this ties to something like, you know, Gone with the Wind as far as like plantations went and like Southern movies, but like just just the, the ownership of a ranch and like the land yeah. is so important in any texas movie from like a western to from like red river is so much about that the the settlement that john wayne has has made on this um it's his and he he staked it and and he's gonna be damned if like anyone takes that away from him like 
land is legacy and land is power and um yeah so yeah also beautiful production design beautiful cinematography they have certain scenes where like everything like certain things are played in the dark mm -hmm. like the shad like there's a scene when when taylor confronts rock hudson where she's like i'm gonna leave with the kids to go back to maryland for a bit where she's just completely in shadow and he's lit by the fire and it's just like it's crazy or like there's a part when after uh the sister uh falls off the horse but it's when i think dean and all of them are running into the house and it's like the 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 porch is completely for some reason completely pitch black and their silhouettes because of the blue sky yeah, behind they, it. Yeah, they they I noticed a couple of times they use like screening very yeah. in, in very like cool visual ways like for screen porches and screen doors where it was like very obviously daytime but they were able I mean it's essentially a scrim it's like a practical scrim to to bring the light of the sunlight down. Um, yeah, there were a couple times I was like, oh man, this is like that shot from the Searchers except there's a screen there's a screen over the door yeah. which makes it a little bit darker still. Um, also, yeah. if we're talking technicals, the makeup in this was fantastic. I thought. I mean, you you had to age all these Hollywood actors up to like seventy in this, and it actually looked pretty decent. For I mean, yeah, you hold hold that up to the to the final scene of the Harry Potter franchise. I'd argue that the <laughs> makeup looked better in this. Giant. <laughs> yeah, I think especially Rock Hudson to me was the one that kind of like. He looks like an old man. Yeah, even even in the way he carries himself, like that that last kind of final, um, I, I, the the last kind of final fist fight that he gets in. That's this kind yeah. of a climax almost of his of his arc at least. Um, yeah, he he carries himself like he's old. It's, he, he does a yeah. great job physically with with this role. Wait, I said this earlier before we did the shit before we started recording. And we we're talking about Rock Hudson. You said this was like kind of your only Rock Hudson movie you'd seen outside of his like screwball comedies with Dor doris yeah, day yeah. like, i mean I, i'd seen plenty of rock hudson stuff but it was it was mostly like romantic comedies and the things that he was known for and he's a guy when you go back and look at his career he was in some interesting stuff in the 1950s like all that heaven allows or in the 1960s with seconds like i i, I do think he was like s weirdly one of the more versatile and possibly one of the more underrated actors of his era and sometimes I think he, I think this happens with, I think even Natalie Wood, their HBO did a documentary on her, but like where some, some, something in their later life, either a death or personal life overshadows their career achievements and their films they did. And I think like Natalie Wood's death, I think Rock Hudson uh, contracting AIDS and coming out as like open or as, as being gay and being kind of like this, the first big like uh, Hollywood star that came out, even though it was later in life, I feel like sometimes that overshadows the work he did. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. yeah. Like when I first hear about Rock Hudson, I heard about, oh, he was the guy. He was kind of the big thing that came out. So he had AIDS, and that's what kind of helped move from the AIDS crisis along. Yeah, and, and at he's, least he's also of kind of the 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 person you point to when when you're talking about all of these closeted hollywood stars who are like forced by the studios into fake relationships and all that kind of stuff because he's he's the only person that it's really like 100 who confirmed it himself um you know there's so many uh rumors about these other actors who are forced to live in the closet because of the hollywood studio system and, and he's kind of become the person you point to that you're like oh like rock hudson because we know we know yeah, yeah. from him firsthand that that's what happened but yeah, yeah, I mean that that's that's probably the first thing that you think of when you hear about him. You don't think yeah. of him in this three and a half hour oil movie. <laughs> yeah. Also, shout out Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper was fantastic in this as one of as as their he son. Was. Um as Anthony Jr. Anthony? What's it? No. Uh jo uh, it's Jordy Jr. Jordan Jr. Is, Jr. Is, yeah. Uh, yeah, jo yeah, Jordy. Jor Jordan Benedict the third. Yeah. Uh another great scene, real quick, is the scene in the hotel in Austin where it's Dennis Hopper confronting his dad after the fight with Dean. And it, again, the blocking of it, you have like rock cuts in the foreground, sitting at a, a desk. You have Dennis Hopper uh, in the mid ground, sitting at the couch. And then in the background in the middle is Elizabeth Taylor and the daughter who are on the balcony. And then even farther are the balcony windows across the or across the way from them. Like there's so much depth in the mm -hmm. shot and it's played in a single shot and it's it's fantastically blocked also, as well if we're, I, if we're, I gotta shout out rock hudson's like physicality for one more thing when you're talking about that sequence 
when when Jordy confronts uh, uh, James Dean. So there, there's a scene when Jordy confronts James Dean at a party, and James Dean punches Jordy, and you see Bick just stand up and just like stalk james dean to the front of the room like just like never taking his eyes off of him and then they meet and pick says like do you want to get it here or do you want me you want to <laughs> go outside yeah, you want to step outside that yeah. was amazing it was so good <laughs> so guys check out giant if you get a chance if you have a it chance to, to fly it really does it really I does down, it's I, a well-paced film i texted for three brandon and and i was like i got a lot of stuff going on i don't know if i can do a three and a half hour movie like i'll probably break it up over a couple of days or something and i i watched it in one day i took like a and, and yeah. I, I i was talking to a friend of mine who who loves it and he's he's seen it in theaters he said when you see it in theaters you do get an intermission so i'll grant you that but otherwise you need to just c- commit to it so I, I took like a 30 minute walk around the neighborhood at the like halfway point and then came back and just just did it all in one run and it 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 moves i mean it's covering so much ground it never feels like it has a wasted second it it definitely spends time on things that nowadays you would cut if that makes sense Mm -hmm. like there's certain moments like specifically at the end when when dean's in his uh when he's drunk and he's in his uh kind of uh ballroom area yeah yeah and 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 it it just goes on and it cuts to the uh the daughter of, of Bick who's watching and it just holds on her, her uncle's behind her. And you're just watching them watch Dean just like in a drunken mess and just essentially like a broken man. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's honestly, it's, it's in, in any other story like that, that character would have had a big like realization moment of like, what have I become? And it, it's, yeah. it's kind of wild that his, he has that moment, but it's while he's like incoherently drunk. So you don't even know if that registered at all or if that's something that is tormenting him constantly. But you hear him like cry out for Elizabeth Taylor's character and that he like lost yeah. her. And, and you you hear all of his regrets, but it's unclear if he's even like conscious of that yeah. he regrets all those things. Out of Giant, out of kind of the Western version of Texas, kind of the traditional family version of Texas. And into kind of a little bit of a subgenre of Texas texas horror subgenre so thomas uh we we chose to do and we chose not to do texas chainsaw massacre Mm -hmm. because that's kind of the quintessential like texas horror it's been talked a lot also too not i think it's streaming on shutter um but we felt like we want to talk about shine a light on one that's not as talked about also kind of also based on a true story and also just a little bit of a maybe a maybe a, a hidden film you might want to watch i think it's on prime and that's the town that dreaded sundown came out in 1976 two years after texas texas chainsaw massacre thomas mm-hmm. what is this movie about and then what is the actual story about you can do well and and real quick kind of the difference between this and texas chainsaw massacre is texas chainsaw massacre they're both based on true stories but texas chainsaw massacre based on head Gein, who was not actually a texas native so yeah, yeah. <laughs> not telling as much of a texas story as the town that dreaded sundown uh which is the which bills itself as the true story of the texarkana <laughs> murders uh we can discuss how how accurate that is but um but yeah in the in the in the late 40s in the the town of texarkana which is on the border of texas and arkansas which is where the name texarkana comes from a hooded figure uh committed six uh well four Three, like three murders really i think there were three survivors and three uh murder victims um through during the course of like a a, a, a year uh where the first two double murders or first two attempted double murders were on lovers lanes and a a man in a white hood approached the car and would um beat uh the the two people in the car um to the brink of death or mm-hmm. to death and so it became a very uh, famous case. And then uh, like 30 years later, this movie was made, The Town That Dreaded Sundown, which is kind of influenced the like mythology of it even more. Like, I mean, yeah. if, when you when you look back on it and it's unclear at this point that the mythology has become so intertwined with the movie, too. It's unclear as to whether people thought of this guy as as wearing that hood all the time before this but he was really there was really only one witness the very first uh victim who ever like pegged him as wearing a white mask like nobody else nobody else who survived ever even saw him 
so you know that how much how much this movie influenced is is at this point is irrelevant because it's so closely tied into the mythology of the mm-hmm. town now um but yeah this movie is is like billed as a documentary it's um there's <laughs> like documentary uh narration of the whole thing but it is not accurate <laughs> at all and i the whole time i was watching it i was like can you imagine coming into a town and saying i'm gonna make a movie about the true murders that happened here and then when you put it out people go to see it and there's like so much comedy in it like <laughs> it is it's bizarre that was a that was a note i made there's a there's a there's a barney fife character who's just goofy and like just like slapstick dumb southern cop yeah there is literally a scene. So one of one of the victims, one of the victims who was actually killed, was a fourteen year old saxophone player who was coming home from band practice, and she and her her male friend went out to Lovers Lane, and and they were killed there. And in the movie, they turn her into a trombone player, and the killer. Oh yeah. The killer oh, ties God, her to yes. a tree, and then ties a knife to the end of the trombone, and then plays the trombone and stabs her. Yeah. As he's playing the trombone, like. You can never get away with that. <laughs> like, like think back, think back on something that happened in the like a mur- like if a serial killer had been was going around in the eighties and you said I'm gonna make a movie about this and then you completely like made a joke out of one of the murders. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it's it's very weird. But yeah, it, this was this was two years after Chex- Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's very obviously like influenced by this like indie. Um, uh, slasher industry that was rising up around Chainsaw Massacre, around Halloween, around these movies that were coming up at, at this time that you could just make a slasher movie on the cheap and, and it would do well. Yeah, it's 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 weird though. It doesn't quite. It's not that scary. It doesn't really. I don't think it pulls off the atmosphere of something like a Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's. I think what it really has going for it is the like true story aspect of it. But, but, you know, as, as soon as you start looking into it, you realize that it it's, takes a lot of liberties. There's a weird sequence where it's like a, uh, a, um, Oh gosh, that car chase <laughs> where like, it's, it's just, it, it, it's like you're in like a, a Smokey and the bandit yeah. movie. Yeah. You're just like, I'm like, what is going on here? Like, and it, and it has a good setup of like this, like Texas, I don't know if it's a marshal. This uh, this Texas Ranger shows up to town to solve the case. And for some reason, it's just kind of this like, yeah, it's it's the tone. The tone is very weird. And I mean, there's parts if you go back and and rewatch Texas Chainsaw Massacre, kind of the 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 character. uh, I can't remember anybody's names right now, but the character in the wheelchair is kind of treated as this kind of like slapstick joke. And I mean, there's there's goofy stuff and in all of these movies but this one like i mean it's it's like it's straight the the the, the uh one deputy is like he's straight out of the andy griffiths show i mean it, it is way over the yeah, top because it, it almost like it starts out more as a drama and as like a heart like a, as almost like a police because it's not the texas ranger but the main sheriff in town when he's like trying to track him down i think it's play, uh the deputy mm-hmm. uh like the part when he's out on the land he i think sees a car and then discovers two bodies is what it is mm-hmm. like it's kind of a great sequence but yeah it, it, it definitely the tone gets yeah, lost some stuff it pulls off really well I, I i love the the final kind of chase that the the ranger and the deputy have um yeah or the kind of the i mean it, it's 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 kind of pegged as the climax because of course how do you do a climax to a film where the killer was never caught but um yeah. they have that that sequence like that's shot like partially slow mo where they're on either side of a train and they're like shooting yeah. through the the train cars that was i thought that was really well done yeah and it's also a weird movie it's very meta mm-hmm. uh the ending at least i won't i won't spoil it but the ending was is a very like meta ending i and also i'm i'm not sure how i feel about the doc the like the the documentary style narration it feels like an episode of dragnet to me yeah. But that that really I mean, you can see what they're going for and that they were like, we've this is what sets us apart from Texas Chainsaw Massacre is like, we've got a true story. So we've got to bill it as close to to a, a, a true story as uh, as we've got going. Yeah. And um, while we're talking about this movie, I'm going to I'm a step on probably I don't know if you're going to do stats at the end of this, but I'm, I'm a step on one of your stats and just go ahead and make a guess that Ben Johnson is, is going to be in the most movies on this list. Let me see. I didn't look at him. He's not currently on my list. Huh. 
I will say that. Because he did, um, I know he was in Last Picture Show. He was in uh, The Wild oh, Bunch. Man. He was in... Uh, Is, what, was Wild Bunch Texas? Do I have that on the list? I think so. I think he was in he was in the getaway. Um no, he was he oh. was in Sugarland Express. The the number for stats is five. So if he was in five movies or more. He was also in a movie called Tex that we don't have on the list. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple that we don't have on the list, probably. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's that I don't know of. That's all right. If if Wild Bunch is on the list, that's last picture show, Wild Bunch, Getaway, Sugarland Express, Town the Dreaded Sundown. So he has five. Mm-hmm. It is in Texas and Wild Bunch. Okay, so Ben Johnson. Oh, he was in Rio Grande. I think that's. A, I'm pretty sure that's about the like Mexican American War. Okay, well we'll come back to that later. <laughs> Just saying, love I'll Ben Johnson. T- love him. Yeah, we'll- and we're 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 gonna cover him when we do our episode on Last Picture Show, which is next week. But yes, okay. So I'll, I'll put him up there again. The numbers that the, the movies that are on our Letterbox list are not every Texas movie ever made. So he's also he's he's uncredited in Red River. Oh, I'm looking at he was a stunt man. Wow. Anyway, must have been Texas based. But there are two other actors who are who are up there with five movies apiece. But how is this a Texas movie? Um, I mean, I think it's it's I mean, for the one thing, it's it's it is a true story. So it's tied to this this town specifically. I, I read an article a few years back that was I mean, it was it was um it was like a feature piece that was really interesting about how they screen this movie every year and how this movie has been. And, 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 and it, it kind of a, it talked about how ridiculous the movie is and how strange it is that the town has embraced this like version of what happened as much as like they acknowledge the actual history of it. Like they, they're this, this movie has become so entwined in like the identity of this town, uh, which is kind of wild uh, when you think about it. I think, you know, as far as like the, the Texas as a whole goes, you've got the Ranger coming in, which is, yeah. y- you know, something beyond any, there's Texas Rangers, man. It's, it's like, it's, it's, this it's its own thing that like no other state really has. Like, obviously everyone has like state, uh, you know, law enforcement, but there's something about the Rangers and there's something about cops walking around in cowboy hats. Like, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and, and and the law, like, I think something that you'll see across all these movies is kind of the lawlessness of Texas. Um, and and even even in modern day, like, it's still in the character of Texas. You know, it was, it was it's a state that wasn't a, it wasn't won in the Revolutionary War. It, it was afterwards, and there's there's blood in the soil, and, and, and the cowboys were there. And and I think this is kind of like the the negative side of, of that, is like the, 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 like the bandits are still kind of embraced throughout this genre as it goes on. But like you, you've, you've also got these like psycho killers, uh, that I think that's what, uh, Texas chainsaw and this both kind of embrace that idea of like this in this sprawling land, like anyone could be out there. Like you never know who you're going to come across. There's a mystery to it all. Yeah. Should people check Texas or the town dread sundown out? If you, if you like slasher stuff and you, I think if you appreciate the kind of silliness that comes along with horror, especially vintage horror, you'll have a good time. It's, it's not, it's not my favorite. If you're interested in like true crime, it's kind of interesting to, to read that and then to watch that and then read the, the, the true events. Um, and the lawsuit that came after the movie, cause someone was upset how it wasn't true. Yeah. That happened. A little, someone yeah. sued. Yeah. Um, the, the theories that the the reason the killing stopped is because the killer moved to the San Francisco Bay Area and became the Zodiac Killer. Um, 30, 30, 30 years later, apparently. <laughs> uh, there's there's theories. Uh, because apparently he wore a hood both times and then there, that was the only person who could do that. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. I think it's I think it's it's kind of hokey, but I also last time I went back and watched Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I was like, this is not as scary as I remember this being. This is pretty hokey as well. So if you embrace the fun of horror, you know, you'll have a good time. We're starting to move into the 80s now. And what I'm starting to see in the 80s is I'm starting to see a little bit more character dramas within Texas. So I'm seeing Tender Mercies with uh, Robert Duvall. Another movie called Come Back to the Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean, which is an interesting companion piece to Giant because it's about uh, these women who are part of a James Dean fan club who live right outside Marfa, Texas, which is where they shot Giant. And so one of the characters says that she had sex with James Dean and had his baby. 
and like that's part of the storyline and they're and it's like a reunion where they're meeting up 20 years after james dean died you're seeing movies like that but the one we want to talk about terms of endearment so i didn't think of this as a texas movie when like looking at it and i realized that it took place a good bit of it took place in houston so can you give us kind of a reasoning of why this is a texas movie because it was written by or the or the book it was based on a book by a texas author correct yeah larry mcnarchery is is texas literature i mean that that is uh he he is texas like it, larry mcmurtry is is a ridiculously prolific author who uh wrote about everything from cowboys to modern day mother-daughter relationships and the and the crazy thing about larry mcmurtry is not only did he write like so many books but almost all of his books like were series as well so like there's sequels to terms of endearment there's sequels to last picture show there's sequels to lonesome dove um it's he like it's insane how much just content the man wrote but uh i pretty much everything he did right was set in texas and he's one of those authors like we were talking about if if, if you had to put your finger on like texas gothic it's it's him he, he's he every story that he writes is somehow intricately tied to texas life whether it's tied to the land or like the way that specifically small town life is lived um there, there's just something about the things he writes that like it has to be set in texas i'm looking at all of his books and it is like you're, you're like you said it's all like he has standalone books for sure he still writes by the way yeah. he's 83 he's still alive yeah. go back and look at like some of the earliest movies based off of his books and like all the way through to it, it's crazy like how, his, how his, wide his, his career has spanned his his the movies based on his work have earned a total of 26 oscar nominations and 10 wins Last Picture Show, Terms of Endearment, and Horseman Pass By looks like one of the other ones. Oh, inspired the movie HUD. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we were going to talk about HUD on this. I didn't realize we were going to talk about multiple Larry McMurtry novels, but we didn't. we're not talking about HUD. Go check HUD out, though. It's great. So Terms of Endearment, it, it's part of a series in his novels called the Houston series. Six novels. That's interesting. Terms of Endearment is about essentially this mother-daughter relationship between aurora greenway and emma greenway horton hey hey mm -hmm. um sure mcclain yeah. plays aurora deborah winger plays emma and it's kind of uh it starts it's deborah winger's character ends up getting married to jeff daniels flap is his name and it's and they kind have of a, they have a they have a son named tommy oh wow tom horton yep <laughs> So it, this has kind of been like, it's it's directed by James L. Brooks, who I, will play an important part later on in some of these in one movie we're going to talk about later. But it's kind of has this um, uh, reputation as being like a tearjerker, and sometimes what people would say is like a chick flick. But I don't really see it that way. I think it's a very it is a mother daughter relationship, but there's something about this when rewatching it that I. I, it, I feel like it's it's aged very well to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there was something I noticed in this, and I don't know if if it was the time period we're currently in, and it wasn't meant to be this way, but I'm kind of reading into it, where everything kind of feels like snapshots. Like, weirdly, photographs play an important part in this movie, and so, at least to, in, my, in my view, where, like, people are showing things in photographs where it's like Deborah Winger when she's with John Lithgow and she has an affair with John Lithgow, but she's leaving to move away. He's like, Oh, can I get a picture of you? And she gives him a picture show, showing pictures of her kids to her friends. Like it's pictures are weirdly like a reoccurring thing that might be just because pictures nowadays are a rarity. It's like, let me pull out my phone and show you like all the pictures I took on my trip when say in the 1980s or whenever, like, a hard copy of a photo in your wallet was like a big thing. And why I think this is important is because in the movie, it feels like you're like flipping through a scrapbook. You're popping in to these characters at specific moments in their life. And you're weirdly not missing any information in between. It's like, you'll just see like two scenes from one specific era in their life. And then just move forwards with no explanation. Mm -hmm. McLean and Deborah Winger are great. I love Jack Nicholson in this movie as this like, 
retired astronaut who lives next door who's this like womanizer and him and shirley mcclain end up having a relationship what's some favorite stuff for me from this movie um i think just kind of and this this is kind of the magic of james l brooks too it's got to be but like how stacked this cast is and when you when you go back and rewatch it and you're like oh there's randomly danny devito playing like this side character for yeah. for a couple of scenes and and even Nicholson kind of taking this role, and I mean, it's a very like he's uh, did he win an Oscar for he it? Did. Or he, was, he did. Yeah. He did. It's not he. He is not a main character whatsoever. Like he is a a side character in in a time period where you would not think of Jack Nicholson taking a side character role. Yeah, and that's gotta you gotta chalk that up to like James L. Brooks. Like you gotta chalk that up to him being able to to make that work. But yeah, it's 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 great. I, it was one of those. I, I think we talked about it on the like physical illness episode where I was like, I had seen this once and I never wanted to rewatch it because you get like this thing in your head that you're like, that's a cancer movie. And I don't want to watch a cancer movie right now. But that's like the last 20 minutes of the movie. And it's played extremely well. Like it's it's not like. I don't know. Sometimes you just get these things in your head like, oh, that's going to be sad. I don't want to watch that. And, and it is sad, but it's also hilarious. And and everyone in it is is perfect. And, and it's awesome. And and I think when we're talking about how is it Texas, I think one of the things that it, it hits very well without ever like no one ever like says this out loud. But there's this this thing and, and you see it in a lot of these Texas movies when you live somewhere that it's like eight hours in any direction to not be in Texas anymore. There's this like weird, like got to get out of Texas energy. That's like, yeah, that's different from like, I got to get out of Alabama. I got to get out of South Carolina. Like, sure. Go, go hop in the car and you'll be out of there in an hour or two. But like, you can't do like, you could live your entire life and never get out of Texas. Like it's very possible. Um, and never go anywhere. Yeah. And, and 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 you see that in this like in 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 uh in deborah winger's character like kind of trying to get away from her mom even though they're very close mm-hmm. and, and 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 having to go other places and and how difficult it is for them to be apart uh when they are apart because they're this like texas family like you, yeah. you live and die on your land in texas and that's it and uh so it's like the familiar relationships are they're just kind of different in texas storytelling and 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 moving away is is different because it's it's so far it's it's interesting you said because i think that's also that's also you brought it up with james dean's character in uh giant where he's wanting to get out of texas like i want to get out of texas and he ends up just staying there yeah if you if you say like i want to get out of ohio like sure hop in the car you're <laughs> you're, you're gone but like it's it's not that easy in texas texas just as weirdly is kind of like a accepted place for things like that to happen like for her stories like that to happen mm-hmm. like when i see like i don't see many when i see like a southern story most of the time it's someone in texas saying i want to get out of texas i want to get out of my small town and go somewhere else and it makes more sense like you're saying like we're eight hours either way that's it's gonna take you a day to get out of texas probably at least depending on where you're at and depending on where you're going so yeah, it also again it, it goes with the whole family conflicts and everything in the family drama, which I think is present throughout most of the genre. It's multi generational. Also, too, the interesting thing, which I just realized when talking about this, about we we're talking about giant and these characters who were holding on to the time, like their previous time, and time is dragging them along. I would say the same thing with Shirley MacLaine's character in terms of endearment, because throughout the movie she's trying to like age herself down she hates when people call her grandmother she's trying to be like she's trying to be more like deborah winger's sister and best friend than her mother like their relationship has this kind of sister quality to it i got i gotta throw this out there yeah been watching been watching a lot of gilmore girls during (laughs) during quarantine and i think amy sherman palladino owes a huge debt to this movie (laughs) for the dynamic for the main dynamic in, in gilmore girls is that gonna be our audio clip we're gonna play um because <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah their their relationship their banter back and forth is so great and weirdly what forces Sharon mcclain to actually like become a mother and become a grandmother is when deborah winger gets sick 
-hmm. Like literally her, her, her clothes change, her hairstyle changes. She's putting on less makeup. She's now wanting to take care of the grandkids. She's being more forceful and trying to parent them. And she really wasn't like that with Deborah Winger or the grandkids before that. Like when you saw her with the grandkids, it was almost, she like hated seeing them because it reminded her that she was a grandmother. Mm. Maybe I'm just reading into it, but just, that's why I felt well, like I noticed a, a, a clear change in Shirley McLean's character when Deborah Winger's character gets sick. It's just like, she shifts mm. and to shout out Jack Nicholson real quick with this. I think it's one of Nicholson's most, nuanced performances mm -hmm. because he's not playing a loud crazy guy that you would think of nicholson and like one foot of the cuckoo's nest or even as good as it gets he's not playing like sarcastic jack like he's playing this kind of quiet guy even though he is like a womanizer and he's loud if, in moments if, when he's I, like, if i read this script Jack Nicholson yeah. at, at, in the even in the time period, Jack Nicholson would be far from the person that I would cast in this role. So it's supposed to be Burt Reynolds. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's that's someone like that's like a like a hyper masculine like alpha male kind of heartthrob character, which is not yeah. as talented as Jack Nicholson is. I don't think you could ever say that Jack Nicholson was a heartthrob in his entire career. I don't. I just sorry. <laughs> so apparently, uh, yeah, Brooks wrote the role for Burt Reynolds in mind. And he turned it down because he was doing a movie called Stroker Ace. But that's that's the thing about Nicholson is like Reynolds would not have brought the 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 humanity, I think, to if, if you do, if you play into him being so handsome, like Nicholson brings the swagger to the, he might not have like the physical appearance, but he brings that like playboy swagger to it. But then he also yeah. has the, the depth that's needed. Yeah. And Ren Ren Reynolds, I agree with you. Reynolds would have played up the sex appeal more. And I don't know what it would have been like if if he would have been like, I don't know, if, I don't I don't know how he would have been at the very end because my favorite moment in the movie with Nicholson is when Shirley McLean goes back to the motel after Deborah Winger's been sick, and Nicholson calls her name and he's like standing up at the on the stairs, mm -hmm. he's coming to her after being kind of a hole the entire time or at the very end to her, and it's an apology and he's in, and he's in a spot where he's never been the guy to go and apologize to the woman. It's always like, I'm just using a woman to have fun. And now he's like, truly cares about her. And he doesn't know what to do in that moment. And he's just awkwardly standing on the stairs of like, but it's just a, it's a nice moment with him. And I don't know if Bert would have pulled it off. Maybe he would have. And Jeff Daniels, I think plays a, an a, it's, it's a weird role for Jeff Daniels. Cause I don't think he ever played this type role later in his career. He, he's, he's fantastic in this. Like, it's like part, it's like part dumb and dumber, like a little bit of that character. Like he's kind of just like a loser goofball, but then also he like the whole thing. He's he can, he goes from like goofball to like slime bag to like actual human being by the end of it. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's all over the place in a great way. Like it's, it feels real. Like it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, sometimes a character is like in a movie is like one thing and you're like, no one is actually in, in real life is that one thing. Uh, and you're seeing him mature, I think, throughout his life. Yeah, and it was a second movie. But you can see why people would watch him in this, and the Fairley brothers can go, oh, there's my Dumb and Dumber, but also, like, Aaron Sorkin can be like, there's my, like, lead, uh, <laughs> like, news anchor. Like, he's he's got, you can see, like, the, the capability of both in this movie. Yeah, in that movie. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm going to bring up this name real quick. Best art direction, Polly Platt. Hmm. She is the ex-wife of Pierre Bogdanovich. So she also worked on Last Picture Show. And she's important for our next movie because she was a producer for it. And that's Bottle Rocket, directed by Wes Anderson. And so we're, we're, we're out of this kind of 80s character dramas. And we're moving into this kind of Texas indie movement into the late 80s, early to mid 90s where you're seeing directors like Richard Linklater pop up. You're seeing directors like Wes Anderson pop up. You're seeing Robert Rodriguez. What are your thoughts on this? Cause you had a comment that was interesting about the move about like the movement of like how it was different compared to earlier. Yeah. I mean, I think, and I, and I do think that this period we, we didn't really talk about when we were talking about those 70 slashers, like those were all independent movies yeah, yeah, as yeah. well. Um, they just didn't have like the prestige that these movies got, but I think you have to, Oh, 
those movies is like Texas Chainsaw Massacre as being the movie that's like, hey, if you got if you can get a camera to Texas, there's so much potential for like, yeah, it's there's there's so many different like cities and 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 landscapes like the you, you know the 90s really were the time period i think i called it a decentralization of of the film industry but like it, it yeah. was hollywood and there were like there were indie movies but like hot they almost everything came from hollywood until the 90s and like birth of vhs and yeah, yeah. all these people that could like all of a sudden get their hands on a, on a on a camera and and that's that's when you could make a movie from wherever and you've got kevin smith coming out of jersey and you had so many interesting voices coming out of texas all around the same time yeah and like link later like I, I was just texting i was like it's wild that like link later rodriguez and wes anderson were all like kicking around texas making like indie movies in the same like five-year period that's that's insane just and, and to see like where they've all come since then like you know link later kind of went into the studio system and kind of came back out a little bit i feel like he's more prolific outside of the studio system now even though he still works within it yeah. whereas rodriguez just did you know a lead of battle angel like this gigantic blockbuster cgi movie and like wes anderson is is wes anderson and how, how could you watch bottle rocket and and see i don't know like how can you see fantastic mr fox coming out of bottle rocket like it's like it's he, insane. He, he becomes like bottle rocket i feel like is it, it's a texas movie and mm. somehow there there are hints of what wes anderson would become in terms of certain visual like how he's cutting and his use of music but like colors i mean you've got like yellow yeah, yeah. is you know it's not as controlled as everything but like there's very obviously like at some point he said this bright yellow color is going to be yeah the color of this movie and same with red like luke wilson is wearing like a red uh pullover and mm. then when they, the motel they're at red is a very prominent color in all the rooms and on the outside the exterior of the motel so that's a very big that's a very so you big... never really have that like you never really have that like center framing or the the yeah the, um you know the the where everything's like perfectly design that, that he's come to be known as but you can see it start and and even like just the scene where luke wilson visits his little sister you're like oh there's a precocious child like there's, <laughs> there's all the all the like uh makings of wes anderson are there it, it, that's yeah. why i love i love watching like a first feature for someone who's got a really strong voice and that's yeah. that's why i will argue to the death with anybody who talks bad about mean streets to me because like <laughs> it's just it is incredible to go watch like pure concentrated scorsese and he it's like he almost like doesn't know what to do with it it's just like so much martin scorsese and he, it, he's not sure where to put it and it's um, not a, that's not his debut but it's i like know but i think like, it, it, I, I, yeah, i've seen his debut yeah. i think this i think mean streets is the one where he's like he's like this is this is me like this is what i want to make this is what i want to make yeah yeah, yeah and, it, and it's not like it's not processed it's like raw <laughs> yeah yeah um and, and that's what this feels like i feel like for anderson but but yeah like i was saying it's it's just it's such an exciting time in indie films in general but but you don't really think about how much of it was coming out of texas and how different yeah. all the guys who were coming out of texas like truly were like you're saying you have slacker in 1990 you have um el mariachi 92 days and confused 93 Another good movie called One False Move uh, in 92 with Bill Paxton and Billy Bob Thornton that I love. I think it's it's a little bit in Arkansas, but then they go into Texas at one point. Um, but that's still a studio movie. But then you get Reality Bites by Ben Stiller, which takes place in Houston, which I don't remember it taking place in Houston. Desperado, Bottle Rocket, Suburbia. Well, and even when you think like, like you can talk about, you know, um, you can talk about like all tours coming up out of Texas. But even when you like, and it, you, you, when you tell people sometimes this these days who haven't seen Bottle Rocket, when you're like, yeah, Luke Wilson and Owen Wilson started with Wes Anderson and they all wrote yeah. this movie together. Like people don't even know that that tie exists. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Owen Wilson's been in some of his movies. But like these two guys came up together and you talk about Matthew McConaughey, like Linklater picking McConaughey out of the like hotel lobby. Um, it's it's yeah, it was Texas was huge in that in that time. Now, quickly, what is, what is Bottle Rocket about? So Bottle Rocket is about uh, three friends who are like early 20s, like college age uh, in Texas, who have all kind of fallen out of the norm. Like all their friends are off at college. And uh, one of them 
Dignan, played by Owen Wilson, is kind of manic. They've talked about him having done a stint in a mental hospital, and he is convinced that he wants to be a like a career criminal, like a like yeah, a, yeah. like run he has a fifty heists. year pl- he has a fifty year plan of how like, to, yeah, yeah. how to run heist, and he wants to get in with like the local the local underground. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Anthony uh who's played by luke wilson is uh just kind of floating he's kind of aimless he's dropped out of college and he also did a stint in a mental hospital and is now like just not very motivated and just kind of goes along with whatever dignan he's, yeah. he's just seems like he's along for the ride he doesn't really care about running heist but he'll do it and um he just he just kind of does whatever dignan says and uh it's yeah, it's just kind of about their 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 journey. <laughs> it was it was a short film first, mm-hmm. and James L. Brooks I think saw the short film and was like, "Hey, they can make them." Or like, "I'm going to contact them." He was the executive producer on Bottle Rocket, and then Polly Platt was a producer on it. So this is like about a decade after Terms of Endearment, and so she's one of the main producers. So it's like they're continuing, even though th- those two are not really Texas filmmakers, Polly Platt or Brooks. They have like the Texas DNA because of terms of endearment because the last both, picture show both worked on McMurtry projects. Yeah. It's, it yeah. all ties back to Larry McMurtry, man. I'm telling you, <laughs> he's the MVP of the genre is what you're saying, yeah, right? For sure. Uh, uh, but you no, know, and I think about bottle rocket talk about it. Owen Wilson just has his persona. I feel like down pat right at the beginning of his career. Oh, I, I love, and I love the, the opening of this movie is, so you're, you're introduced to Anthony who's in, who's checking out of the mental hospital and, uh, and Dignan is outside, like, and Dignan has this whole, is like in like full black gear with his binoculars. And you have this scene where like Anthony throws his like bed sheets tied up as a rope out the window. And his doctor comes in and it's like, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're good to like, you're, you can leave. And Anthony's like, yeah, but my friend doesn't realize that I'm here voluntarily. And he put together this whole escape plan. So I'm just going to go with it. And then he like, he climbs out the window, but Dignan's like watching as he then proceeds to like hug everyone goodbye on his way out. <laughs> and Like, it's very, very obvious that like, he's not escaping. And then, but then when he gets to Dignan, Dignan's like, oh, great. Yeah. Awesome. Let's go. Like you did it. You made it. It's uh and then he's like, he's like, oh, who's that? And the doctor's pulling in the bed sheet. He goes, oh, did you hire, you hire a janitor to do that? That's so smart. That's so yeah. smart. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love it. He's he's so good in this. And and I I, I think I told you recently. I, I I just recently we rewatched all the Wes Anderson movies, and I, and I, it's it's you know you can you can see him progress in both his visual style and his writing style, and that is that is often like dependent upon who he's writing with. Yeah. And, and he he did his first three movies were with Owen Wilson and uh, I think I still think those are the best scripts that he's ever had and I, I agree and it's unclear you know how much was him and how much was Wilson I mean he's been like a co-writer on all of his scripts but I, I think I think his his finest screenplay is Royal Tenenbaums and uh, and Rushmore is incredible as well like from from script format and and so you, you really it make it really makes you appreciate that that owen wilson did have a hand in writing all these and make you wonder why he hasn't written more stuff but you're also starting to see some of these um kind of older directors work within uh the texas genres you have i mean even 10 cup with ron shelton where it's i think takes place in texas and kevin costner is a golfer but the one we want i wanted to talk about i'm really intrigued to see what thomas has to say about this movie is lone star which is a again kind of like giant it's this multi-generational story but takes place on kind of like kind of parallel timelines in a way it's kind of it's it's it it's directed by john sales and john sales is also like a novelist so lone star kind of has this novel feel to it where you're just kind of popping in and out of different eras but the transitions are pretty seamless to where it feels like one continuous story but a lot of it's done with family so it stars chris cooper who's the sheriff in the small texas town and at the very beginning of the movie a body is found out in the middle of like nowhere on this like land and chris cooper as a deputy is trying to figure out who this body is you find out it was a sheriff that was killed like decades ago and what chris cooper thinks 
is that he believes his father, who was the deputy for so many years, actually killed this previous sheriff who's been found dead out there. And his father and the flashbacks are played by Matthew McConaughey. And so you have that, that's kind of your main like core story, but you're having all these other kind of like side stories about other families and about a certain relationship that Chris Cooper has with someone who's a, a teacher uh, in the town that he had like a relationship when he was younger and McConaughey and her mother kind of ended it. Um, so Lone Star, Thomas, what were your thoughts on Lone Star? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was definitely felt Texas. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 if, if anything, I think it is about the Texas identity and, and, and especially the, this idea of like living on this land that doesn't really belong like Texas more than yeah. any other part. I mean, obviously America doesn't belong to anyone except for the, the, the natives, but Texas, Texas especially has such a recent history of of war and ownership and and you know being its own country for a little while and it 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 touches on a lot of that and and all these different people of different races and of different backgrounds and how everyone kind of feels like out of place in texas like no one really feels like like texas is their home um i do think it got a little too broad some of the storylines i could have done without and they just didn't feel like they were really brought home in a in a good way i mean you're dealing with there's a there's a there's an army base in town and you're dealing with like three different stories coming out of that army base alone yeah that like (laughs) none of them really ended up feeling that important to me in the end there are a lot of like side stories in this movie that's why i say it's kind of like sales is taking his novel approaches that he does and putting him in in a in a film and some of it's a little wonk i actually really love this movie but i understand that critique yeah and and it's i think from an editing standpoint he cut it himself and i think it's one of those things that like he did it because he had all these transitions of the time periods in his head yeah and those work really well but there were a couple times i was just sitting there i was like i do not need to see like this guy driving down this road for like a minute and a half straight with nothing <laughs> happening. Like I, I texted, a, I, I didn't want to text you cause I wanted to save it for, for, for now. But uh, I texted another friend of mine who, who edits and had, had seen this and giant and was like, uh, this giant moved. F- giant was an hour and 15 minutes longer than this. And this feels longer than giant. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I think it's, it, I think, all, it, the the jumping back and forth is is very engaging and um it's it's uh the the overarching storyline is is fascinating uh definitely did not see the end coming don't want to spoil it for anybody <laughs> but um i think it i think it is for sure as far as like our our purposes here go it is a texas it is 100 percent a texas movie i mean if anything it is about the identity of a Texan. Like who is a Texan? Who does Texas belong to? Yeah. And, and I, I mentioned it's on a border town. So you're having these kind of conflicts between the Mexican community and the town that live in this border town. And, and, and it's, you're also dealing with kind of immigration and people coming over the border and how some of the like Mexican Americans don't like that, but some are like, it's, it's, and it's also dealing with like the education system and how the whites are upset that the, the, the Hispanic teacher is teaching Mexican history as well. And it's like, it's just a constant conflict. Yeah. And, and it's also, uh, I think a very unique perspective that it brings that I'm sure is a very unique Texas perspective is that you're so used to seeing within a small Southern town like this, the racial tensions between uh, uh, African American community and the white community. And, and, and here they, they touch on it a couple of times is that there's a very, very small African American community. Yeah. And the main tensions are between the Mexican American community and the, and the, and the, the, the white community. And, and so you've got kind of all the, uh, you know, these, all these the tensions going in all different directions and, and where does, you know, where does the violence coming down in the history of, of all these different communities? It's, um, yeah, it's a very unique perspective, and it's it's very Texas in its identity. I wonder if this is a movie that would like work better in like a miniseries format. One hundred percent. I thought that several times. I thought that several times because there was. I mean, there's other stuff that was brought up maybe once or twice. Like you were talking about, there's this there's this argument about education and the, and the, the, these white parents saying, "I 
you, you need to teach the Alamo more. And like, um, and, and the teacher is like, I think everybody knows what happened to the Alamo. We need to talk about like <laughs> what actually happened to the, to the Mexican population who lived here. And, and, um, that was like, it's brought back up a, very briefly at the end, but, um, you and know, even, you, you even guy, have, they're trying to like, bring in a, a a hispanic a hispanic sheriff to take over the job from chris cooper and he's mm-hmm. it's like an election and chris cooper's like do i want to do this because he, he's like i'm doing it because my father did it and the town wanted me because my father died and i had the same last name as him and so it's identity of like should i be here i don't i kind of don't care so it's like i yeah i think chris cooper's also i i like in this movie and it's it's early i think it's pretty early for him Sales kind of work. His first film was with Sales and Mate One, which was in '87, and then this takes place in '96. But yeah, also nominated for uh, Best Original Screenplay. How about McConaughey in this movie? He's not in here much, but it's a very like coming off like three years after Dazed and Confused. It feels very different from McConaughey. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's obviously you. It, it really fits the character like it's someone who is charismatic extremely charismatic like uh, he's good looking like he's yeah, better yeah. looking than chris christopherson so like you can understand why people all the the town like idolizes him but but yeah. there, there's also like something a little scary underneath which you can see yeah. why if you were chris cooper why chris cooper could be like frightened of this man or, or feel badly about this man yeah i think i think there's a lot of uh i think there's a lot of uh marty and um uh oh no 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 marty was woody harrelson right what's um rust rust Rust, 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 Rust Cole. i think there's yeah i think there's a lot of rust cole in 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 this character even though we don't see him much well i read that jeff nichols cast mcconaughey for mud based off his performance in lone star which is like almost 20 years after them like 50 Mm -hmm. years after the movie but he was like i mean he's got this he's got this swagger and i mean obviously that's that's woody wooderson in um Days like that's that's a very that's the thing about wooderson in Daisy and confused is he's like you should hate this guy <laughs> like he's like he's like 24 and he's hanging out with high schoolers but he, he's just got this like the the his 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 like swagger can be so mysterious in a way like it's like do i like this guy is this guy cool is he a loser is he scary yeah like what am i supposed to think about this guy and that is that is the peak mcconaughey like it's all the same swagger but he brings it different ways and that's what he brings to mud it's like what am i how am i am i supposed to idolize this guy is he my like new role model or am i supposed to be terrified yeah yeah um and 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 true detectives the same way and his freaking lincoln commercials are the same way you're like (laughs) do i want to drive a lincoln like (laughs) do i want to buy one do i want to like stay away from the dealer talking about what's going on here but it's cool it's it is cool like (laughs) moving on from lone star kind of more into a, a present day story we have you that we're looking at because again i think we're going through a time in this say 2010s and the 2020s where you're seeing a little bit of, again of a rise of a texas filmmakers in that area so you're seeing link layer still working within that genre of texas kind of more so than he was saying in the, in the 2000s it feels like you're seeing even terrence malick go back and do tree of life in texas you're seeing people like jim mickle do uh cold in july and but one of the big ones that I want to talk about was David Lowry, where he had Anthem Body Saints, Ghost Story, and then the one we're going to talk about is the Old Man, the Gun, and he's kind of becoming one of these like Texas, probably I would say one of the the biggest up like not up and coming but kind of the younger Texas filmmakers. Would you agree? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like he's the one I kind of think of. So I've seen Old Man, the Gun a couple times. Thomas had never watched it before this, and so I was really interested to hear what he had to say. Um, Old Man the Gun is essentially based on a true story about this uh, man named Forrest Tucker, played by Robert Redford, who is in his 70s, and he robs banks. He pulls off heists with his buddies called the Over the Hill Gang with Danny Glover and Tom Waits. And he's robbing banks as this uh, detective or police officer played by Casey Affleck is trying to chase him down and it's set in 1981 it they shot it beautifully it looks like it's from that era with the film they're doing 
but Thomas, what were your thoughts on Old Man the Gun? Uh, I loved it. I think I think this is a it's one of those movies you have a hard time picturing anyone else in, and yeah, it's almost yeah. as much even though it's based on a true story, it feels like like Redford was like made for this. Yeah, uh, because it's all about I, how much did this guy get away with f- just for being like charming and handsome when he was younger and and just like overall likable and redford plays it so well it 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 act, it reminds me a lot of of um frank abagnale and and kind of that story from um from catch me if you can um but yeah i i i, I had a really good time I, lowry's a director he's kind of like malik with it, it, another who was another texas director and you just brought him up and we, we kind of you could do a whole other i mean you could do a, a, the whole podcast series on terrence malick i mean he's a, he's a he's a myth he's a legend but um lowry is kind of like malick because i absolutely love some of the stuff that they've done and and other st- other times he can make something that is like so frustrating um i'm just like I, why do i why do i even bother and but it's always going to be distinct it's it's yeah, never yeah. going to be you can never accuse him of being bland either of them i agree with that. um <clears throat> but this this is probably my favorite lowry movie that Same. i've seen so far but lowry this is this is definitely a love letter to robert redford there's so many hint, like kind of tributes to like uh redford's career even the poster is the jeremiah johnson poster and also even like casey affleck does the the sting yeah. nose thing uh-huh. at the end yeah. to him so yeah, it's very much this love letter because Redford plays a big part in Lowry's career because uh, because of Sundance, mm-hmm. where Anthony, Anthony by Saints got accepted to Sundance. And I guess Lowry and Redford really hit it off. So Redford did Pete's Dragon uh, with him. And then uh, Ghost Story gets into Sundance again. No, and then... boy, did Ghost Story hit Sundance. Oh man, yeah. I just that that was everyone just came out of Sundance and they were like, "Oh my god, ghost story." And I was like, "What?" And then and, and we were and you and I were both excited for it and then we were just kind of like, "Okay." I mean, he did he did an interview and said, "This is the best movie I have ever made and will ever make." Like And so we were <laughs> you've, so you've got, hyped. Yeah, you've got one of the most exciting like up and coming directors and he's just like, "I will never make anything better than this." <laughs> like, and then we we were kind of, we were both kind of disappointed by that. And that's the thing, that's why hype's hype's not great, guys. Don't believe the hype sometimes. It'll it'll hurt your experience. Um but yeah, Old Man the Gun, I think it 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 just it it has a very like, old Hollywood feel to it, if that makes sense. And him him and him and Casey Affleck, Redford and him, they only have one scene together, but it's probably my favorite scene in the movie. Oh, it's Affleck is so great. He he gets this like smile. It's so good because Redford's going. Basically, Casey Affleck and his his wife are going out to dinner, and Affleck has figured out who who is robbing these banks. And he knows it's Redford, but he's never met Redford before. And Redford's at the diner with with Sissy Spacek, who he's seeing at the time. And he sees Affleck come in, and he's seeing the Affleck like, "Oh, I, I want to catch, I want to catch this guy." And so Redford like basically confronts him in the bathroom. It's kind of like this joke, like, "Oh, like he doesn't know who I am." And then it just takes a turn, and then mm-hmm. he, and then he realizes, "Oh no, <laughs> this guy knows who I am." This is a scene where it's great when the audience knows something that the character doesn't because you're getting moments that you would not have gotten if you did not know Affleck knew who he was. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. you're you're I mean, in, you're in just, on this comedy. You see you see Affleck realize who it is in the scene and he starts to smile and, and so you're you're in you're in it with him and um yeah it's it's wonderfully played they're both they're both great in this but um it's funny my uh my girlfriend walked through while i was watching it and we had we had watched we had rewatched bottle rocket it was the first time she'd ever seen it the night before yeah and she goes why is everyone in in these texas movies always stealing stuff because <laughs> uh, they're both they're both kind of heist movies and I, and I do think it plays back and we'll talk about a heist movie uh in another episode of our continued texas yeah, yeah series but i think it, it does go back to like the cowboys and the bandits and um there's still this like romanticism of the outlaw even if it's not set in the wild west um i mean this this 
the the bottle rocket is very obviously about kind of bad bandits but it's still lovable and this one's about the kind of the the thesis of this movie is if you're charming enough you can get away with with anything all these people who were robbed by redford just immediately tell the police how nice he was brief mention we've talked about on the friday night lights episode texas sports movies there's a lot go listen to that episode (laughs) that we kind of covered because it deals with kind of the texas culture you have movies like the rookie with uh dennis quaid even the big green that family soccer film that our our friend hunter barcroft i think loves even everybody wants some everybody wants some with baseball like you it's sports is a very big element of of certain texas movies so quickly genre tropes we talked about these just to kind of keep in mind for the later episodes family drama and conflict between relatives and multiple generations that's been prominent law enforcement and kind of the outlaw and the wild west of texas even in modern day small towns and wanting to leave where you came from and kind of just even just the horrors of small towns like with uh, the town that dreads sundown anything else we missed on genre tropes that we no man i think i think kind of you touched on like law enforcement and and i think a, a lot of texas movies will touch on the duality of like the the person like the ranger and then also the the, the bandit and, yeah, yeah. and a lot of them will focus on both and, and be like two-handers like the old man and the gun or, or no country for old men or even you know in lone star as chris cooper is investigating what he thinks is a murder his father committed we're going back and seeing his father and and um that that that's something that feels very distinctively texas is seeing like the sheriff and the bandit at the yeah. same time and kind of seeing them as equals and getting the motivations of both of them it's like heat but in texas i got you yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, I think i think no country for all men is one of the best kind of summaries of that for sure so stats real quick ben johnson <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that one most popular films top three top three uh uh Days and Confuse. No. What? <laughs> <laughs> I Letterbox, I don't understand you sometimes. Yeah, that, that's that's number ten. Uh Rushmore. No, that's number nine. Uh holes. No, holes is not up here. Um one of them we've mentioned recently within the past five minutes. Ghost story. Ghost story's number four. Ugh. <laughs> More people on this app have seen a ghost story than have seen Dates and Confused. Yep, and and uh, well, uh, this 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 is wrong. Ghost story is up higher for some reason. It's not ghost story. Ghost story should be lower. Uh, Dates and Confused and Rushmore. People have seen more on this app than Ghost Story. Letterbox is a weird feature where it's like if it was I guess watched since Letterbox has been around, it like ranks them higher. I don't get it. So take out what I said about Ghost Story. Uh, 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 no country for old men. That's number one. Okay, all right. I, I, I'm happy with that. With Tree of Life. Tree of Life is number. It says five, but it's actually lower. Boyhood. Boyhood's number two. Uh, uh the Lone Ranger. No, this one you won't, <laughs> this one you won't guess. So I'll just tell you because it's actually I was actually kind of shocked by this. Mm-hmm. Nocturnal Animals. Oh, okay that, 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 that was very that's very, that's a very letterboxed movie yeah like that's anything with anything jake gyllenhaal it's gonna be that's yeah that's a movie that uh i feel like came and went yeah it was very hot button like while it was in theaters everyone yeah. was talking about it briefly but it didn't even i guess it didn't hit like with awards so it didn't really feel like it endured like i don't i don't know anyone that hated it but it was just like it was also michael shannon i think got a nomination weirdly i think aaron taylor johnson got a golden globe nomination and maybe one but i'm not positive um <laughs> but yeah those are the top three um least popular movie you won't get it it's okay <laughs> yeah yeah uh, no, just... I, I actually kind of want to see it uh dancer texas population 81 you you want to see it because it's got ethan embry in it you love ethan embry <laughs> It does have Ethan Embry. Weirdly, it has like three of the dudes from Can't Hardly Wait, actually, now that I look at it. it has Brecken Meyer, mm-hmm. Ethan Embry, Peter Fascinelli, if that's correctly pronounced pronounced. Oh man. Yeah, that kid. Talk about a hot streak. Yeah, so four guys, best friends, have grown up and together in Dan- Dancer, Texas, a tiny town in, in uh West Texas. Years ago they made a solemn vow to leave town together as soon as they graduate. Now it's that weekend, the time has come to put up or shut up. The clock is ticking, and, all, and as, as all 81 people in the town watch, comment, offer advice, and place bets, 
These four very different boys with unique backgrounds struggle with the biggest decision of their lives, whether to stay home or leave home. Hmm. That's a Texas trope. That's what we've talked about. Um, highest rated films. One of them was in post, most popular. Uh, no Country for Old Men. Yep, number two. With a 4.3, I believe. Uh, 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 last Picture Show. Last Picture Show is number three with a 4.1. Wow, that should be a 5.0, people. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're going to get number one at a 4.3, so I'll say it. Paris, Texas. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, Paris, Texas. That's a very letterbox movie, too. Yeah. Days of Heaven kind of tied with three at 4.1. Nice. And then Lonesome Dove, also high up here. Nice. That's not a very letterbox movie. That one's kind of surprising. But only like 3,000 people have seen it. Lowest rated films. Bottom three. (laughs) Uh... Town the Dreaded Sun. <laughs> no, that's that's not far down though. That's a two point nine. Texas Chainsaw Massacre two. No, no, people. That's like a three point one, I believe. Some people really love that movie. Uh, I also the bottom one has a two point four. The bo- two of the bottom ones have two point four. One has a two point five, and it will upset you that it's down this low. Oh, Lone Ranger. Lone Ranger's two point five. Guys, give it another chance. It's a little too long. <laughs> it's it's a little outdated already. Uh, but man it was it's a blast quentin tarantino one of quentin tarantino's top tens of the top 10 of that year yeah it but it they some people rank the alamo with dennis quaid and billy bob thornton point one point higher than the lone ranger i didn't hate that movie i saw that movie uh the last the bottom one the big green oh no our favorite and then in between big green and the lone ranger the astronaut's wife oh yeah uh so most appearances excluding ben johnson for right now uh mcconaughey mcconaughey uh is tied of this list with five um with, with one other person that has been mentioned very early on rock hudson no uh john wayne john wayne uh mcconaughey has dazed and confused bernie lone star dallas buyers club and the newton boys um john wayne has the searchers red river the the original the alamo Rio Bravo in a movie called Hellfighters, where he plays, I believe, a yeah oil well fire specialist. Okay, sounds like a fun movie, guys. Him and him and Catherine Ross. Uh, oh. But I, I, I'll give Ben Johnson because I feel like Ben Johnson is probably up there, either tied with Wayne in reality or possibly surpassed both of them. So last mentions: Are there any movies? besides the ones we're going to cover later on that we haven't mentioned that you want to quickly mention uh i mean i gotta i gotta shout out my terrence malick movies i love them i love those um i think office space you just gotta kind of give it a give it a call out when we were talking about like the big 90s like yeah. indie stuff yeah, yeah. uh my judge like uh, not a lot of people think of office space as being inherently texas but then yeah. when you think of like mike judge your mind very quickly goes to king of the hill and you're like oh okay yeah that, yeah that, that dude's texas guilty pleasure movie other than than lone ranger gotta gotta shout out real quick secondhand lions <laughs> love that movie uh has a 3.3 on letterboxd it's fun that's a, that's just a fun just a, like my, like my mom would say that's just a fun movie <laughs> yeah i i actually i watched secondhand lions a lot growing up that was that was a big one you got hud with paul newman i'll give a shout out um one I, i've said tinder mercies before on a previous podcast so that one uh i'm gonna say one i really like that i think is an underrated film in his filmography is the Sherland express by spielberg mm-hmm. i think that's movie. if you want to watch you're talking about because that's his like uh debut we're talking about debuts that's his like theatrical debut with Sherland express you're seeing Spielberg and probably his most like non Spielberg movie where he's kind of doing this Bonnie and Clyde esque story. And he it's the filmmaking is completely raw. He has like a, a scene where it's like he does a 360 shot within the car and it's done masterfully. And then you have like this crazy long vertigo shot that he does this vertigo, this dolly zoom that he does towards the end of the film when someone like has a sniper and is like aiming for something it's it's crazy it's just a very raw underrated spielberg and then also cold in july with uh sam shepherd michael c hall and my boy don johnson and your boy wyatt wyatt russell 
So yeah, quickly, where should people start if they want to start with the Texas movies? And this could be any movie we could have covered or not have covered or covering in future episodes. I mean, honestly, I do think it's a little intimidating, but I do think Giant is a is a great like starting just point. Everything, everything Texas. Yeah, yeah, if you're looking for like pure concentrated Texas, I think that's a, that's a great place to start. If if you're intimidated by that, um, I do. I, I really love Red River. Um, highly recommend that one. And it, and it, it, it also, I think you need to start with something like kind of Western and, and some of that earlier stuff where you get the, like the land and because yeah. everything, everything after that is like a play on that. Um, yeah. no matter as we've kind of seen today, no matter like what genre you get into, it's all kind of playing off of like the, the, the Texas identity and how tied people are to the land. Um, so I, I do think you, you should start with, with one of those for I, sure i agree with that i like both those i think hud's not a bad one either because mm-hmm. that also deals with kind of like family drama and kind of this the the and that's a mcmurtry for you it is yeah so start with the mcmurtry film basically is what you're kind of yeah. saying man <laughs> um i would agree with both those uh so yeah we have coming up real quick uh for the next three weeks after this we're doing a episode on the last picture show next week is the plan uh after that hell or high water so we're looking at kind of a classic film of the Texas genre and then more of a contemporary film and kind of kind of dissect what we talked about in this episode and put it in more like a more kind of case study with those two. Uh, and then we're going to finish off the month with Richard Linklater, which will be a there's some movies that I haven't seen from him that I'm going to have to watch during this time period that I'm intrigued to see. I'm going to rewatch Boyhood. You, you keep, keep an open mind, man. I'm going to keep an open mind. I think it was also the hype train with that as a ghost story hype train. Well, now, now Boyhood's got almost the opposite of a hype train. There's like a hate train on it. Yeah. So you can. So now, now maybe I'll like it this like, time. <laughs> now, now you can go back and be like, oh, this is better than like most people say yeah. it was. So I'm, ex- I'm excited for, for, for all of these coming up. And I'm excited to kind of look at the link later stuff. So, yeah, we're going to be prepping on that for a while. Um, but, yeah, guys, thank you so much. Make sure you stay safe during this time. I know some places are opening back up. Just be careful. Uh, be aware of what's happening and get good information. Um, make sure you listen to the nation on Spotify, and Apple podcast, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and look at our medium. We're putting more and more stuff out there right now. And hopefully we'll continue to do that for the rest of the month. And hopefully a few Texas kind of special articles again, Thomas, thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. As always guys, go watch some Texas movies and thank you so much for listening. We hope you listen to more episodes soon. Bye.